It is time for us to turn our attention to hurling. I'm delighted to welcome James Scale back to the show. James, the week of a championship like this where it's beginning to get serious, the training has all been done. What's it actually like to be involved in a camp where you're hurtling towards the championship and things are getting real? How are you guys? Um, it's very exciting. Um, I use. I know I'm a, I'm a country boy at heart here, but it's a bit like when you let cattle out of a shed at winter. They go jumping or leaping. It's kind of the way it is in, <laughs> in training, let's say, in the last week or so, um, just in, in preparation, because everything has culminated this week. Um, so you, when you get your winter programs back in, in, in a standard year, should I say, in October, November, and you're starting at the gym and you're running in the dirty nights, uh, it's pouring rain down top of you, and you're, you're, you're basically miserable. All that's in your head is the championship week. They say that keeps you going as such. And I suppose guys have been looking in one sense uh, that, that they're, they're, the league has been so close to the championship this year. So they've had a run of games prior to the championship and have a good bit of practice. Um, but everyone's excited, like everyone's looking forward. There's this touch of nervousness too. Like you obviously have guys who are guaranteed to start in the team. You know, most teams would probably have uh, maybe 10, 11 guaranteed starters. And there's probably eight or nine guys who were vying for the last four positions. So those guys are kind of nervous trying to do everything right. They're looking over at managers to see you. They're looking at them. They're waiting to see if they're going to come over and talk to them for a second to, to, to announce that they're going to be on the team. So there's a touch of nervousness for some, but most excitement for most. Uh, the, the, presumably, from a, a, a player's perspective, there's not really much you can do to alter the manager's thinking at this point. It, it always seems to me like managers have a bit of confirmation bias going on and they, they need to have had in their head most of the big decisions made a couple <clears> of weeks back. And yet, at the same time, they need to keep everybody on their toes to the point where everybody believes they still have a chance. Yeah, and that, that's that's the issue as well, like that some managers would say, some are better than others, should I say, at that. And in my experience, that has been the case, whereby you know, their, their man management skills have been impeccable and they've been able to keep the 30, 35 guys all in sync and go in the same direction without creating any much of a division between, let's say, the starters and, and the guys who are on the fringes. And let's say when man management is not going well, you can really sometimes the clicks creating uh, where starters would, would nearly kind of form groups of their own and say and that's a that's a terrible terrible envir environment to be involved in because like if a team is going to be successful like you've got to prepare well play well and get a bit of luck so if you're not preparing well which is something you do most um because of kind of i suppose a bad, let's, let's say a bad relation or a bad vibe from management to players and say that's that's detrimental to a team and i think i said from my own experience let's say you could always get a vibe you know you'd get it weeks out like you'd know there'd be a versus b uh, challenge games in inside and training like four or five weeks out from from championship games so you'd know how the manager or management team should i say were thinking um you'd know even by the level of interaction you know so if the manager is kind of uh, i'll say stonewalled you a bit somewhat <laughs> I, I say that loosely you know stonewalled you a bit so, somewhat um you can nearly guess that you're not going to be involved terribly um, but the real settler is, is the a versus b game so like those games go right up to a week for championship and generally the last week the a team is put out entirely to get a to get a sense of I suppose, uh, a bit of a game together, get a bit of feeling together, let's say, in, in pattern of playing and whatnot. So it's um, it's a funny one for managers. Like I, it, I think it's very difficult to actually physically manage because every player that goes into a county team um, is obviously the best player in their club. There's no doubt about that. So they, they'll have been used to being the, the number one guy or girl in their club for, for, for many years, let's say, underage level, up into senior. And every time they go back to their club, they're champions, but they're the main person. When they come into a county environment, then... You, they don't know where they are in the pecking order. So that's a bit hard to take from a mental perspective for the player um, to, to kind of transition from, from being top dog in the club to kind of uh, one of the pack in the, in the county team, let's say. And other players take that differently. I've seen guys who have walked out, you know, in years previous, let's say, when they haven't been on a, a start in 15 or 26 because they thought themselves uh, to be higher in the room, you know. So it's it's a chance of one for managers. But I think most managers nowadays, they're, they're not nearly... What I see at the top tier managers, they're they're more man managers. Let's say I know Bill Gates said before. Let's say the secret to good business is delegation, and that's what managers seem to have done. Let's say when you look at the, the Jim Gavins and the and the John Kylies, they have a team around them. Let's say to manage everything, where they then manage the group as such. So um, I think that's kind of transition out of the whole setup now at the minute, and and players management alike are becoming more interaction from a from a personal perspective as opposed to a sporting perspective. If you get stuck into some of the games then that will get the championship underway this weekend, James. Mm -hmm. If you start with Leinster, Dublin against Antrim, 3 o'clock on Saturday, Leash against Wexford at 6 o'clock on Saturday. We touch on Wexford there, you talk about the, the power of delegation. Do you think Davy Fitz has the, the art of delegation off to a tee yet? <laughs> I did say top level managers, didn't I? <laughs> um, so, no, I wouldn't put... I, I don't think that delegation has been... Has been uh, 
is, it has really been, how do I say? I, I, it's tricky on that one to say. I've had J.B. Fitz in college, don't get me wrong, to say delegation wouldn't be one of the words that he'd have, you know, I'll put that with you. Um, Wexford are a tricky one, guys. I look at Wexford and, like, they're a team, let's say, they're kind of, you know, they're class of the top class team. I wouldn't have them in the top four or five. I would always view them as being a team that are, are they, they nearly have enough, but they don't have enough, you know. They're, they're forward units, they, they don't score enough, let's say, the guys there. I don't think they have the, the quality up front. They have fantastic athleticism, there's no question about that. They have fantastic fitness, but every team across the board has that. So you go to any team, let's say, at top level, they're all going to be as fit as each other, and predominantly they'll be as strong as each other. But what really breaks it down, let's say, is obviously tactical, and then the actual skill of the hurlers you have, and the actual hurling ability. And I look at Wexford, and I, do, I just don't see they have enough. Like, in the last four championship games that Wexford has played Galway, you know, they've been beaten by an average of eight points and have only scored 17 points at the tops of that. So I just wonder where, where the scores are going to come from, you know. And like in, in those four same games, like Galway has scored, I think, 27, 29 points and two others. So their defence offers a bit of leakage too as well. And I just don't see their defence holding out top level forward lines and I don't see the forwards you know, taking down top level back lines. So I, 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 Wexford and Leash, I think they'll come through Leash, obviously. Um, I'm not trying to diminish, diminish Leash's capabilities, but I think when they, they come up against Kilkenny then in, in, in the semi final, that could be dangerous for them. Was the, the, the forwards, uh, the, the, the firepower in the forwards, not an issue in, in 2019, or, or how did they manage to get so close then? That's that's a strange. I, I just think, um, you know, I think momentum is a, is a big thing in hurling too, guys. Like uh, that, that game in 2019 with Galway, they drew uh, 16 points apiece, I believe. And I just think Galway were suffering from a hangover from the two years previous, both mental and physical, you know. So they got a bit of a run. They got through the group by the by, by score difference, essentially, with a last, last spin a point against Kilkenny. And they just got a, just got a, they got a good draw. Do you know what I mean? And they should have beaten Tipperary, let's say, when they were a man up, but they didn't. You know what I mean? That's the size. Like Tipperary had a man down, let's say, when John McGregor got the line, and you know they didn't finish off Tipperary when they had them there. You know what I mean? When they had them there, and like the good teams, I, if if you put in 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 and that year, let's say, if you put in most teams, I should say, against Tipperary when a man down, they were going to come through. You know, um, I just don't, I just don't think they have it. I'm not, I'm trying to be dismissive or negative towards them in any way, shape, or form. I've played them enough times to see. That, that their, their passion, their game style is kind of repetitive, if I'm honest. I know David Fitz said last year after the semi-final, the Lens semi-final, that he tried, they tried, should I say, five different formations. I saw one formation, maybe two. So I don't know where they're getting these formations out of. They didn't work. You know, they were beaten by nine points or seven, seven nine points, yeah. So I'm not sure where, you know, where all the tactical knowledge, like where, where they say, do they think they're, they're more tactically ahead of people than they, than they actually are, you know? Um, so I know I'm being. It sounds I'm being very negative towards Wexford for being dismissive, but look. No, I, I mean, so that's that. the whole point. We've got to try and establish where the the tiers are at this stage. If you were in charge of Wexford, like with this group of players, or if is there anybody out there who could do things differently with this group of players and catapult them into that top tier? Yeah, well, you're looking at the best coaches, aren't you? Like you're looking what Paul Knurk has done with Clare. You're looking what he's now done with Limerick. You know, he's he's transformed a team. Let's say who. Have, who have been there, they almost there, but not quite there, let's say, and, and brought an Ireland to them both, you know? Like, so he's kind of person who come in with a serious air of positivity and no off the field baggage. You know, that's a key thing as well. Because I, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago about prepare well, play well, get a bit of luck. The preparation for Wexford has been staggered in, in, in my opinion, let's say. There, they've, been, they've been too many highlights or lowlights, should I say, in the public eye with regard to off the field activities and on the field or on the sideline, should I say, activities. Um, and they just, they don't need that distraction. Do you know what I mean? And like I've I've been in a, in the dress rooms with David Fitz like and it's 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 an intense place you know what I mean it's it's quite a how would I put this lightly it's quite a hyper dressing room I, I put it that with you um, so the concentration levels could be they could be focused elsewhere if you if you, if you get me um, I I'd be looking at like a Cork and type person who would be really good really genuine like they brought in Niall Corcoran who was a good hurling man as well a Galway guy who spent a lot of time in Dublin he'd have a good hurling knowledge but I don't know how much of an influence he's allowed to have there should I say. Um, but I, I do think, as well, this possibly could be, in my opinion, the last year for Davy. I think there's going to be a change coming this year because, like, they've had relatively minor success. Uh, they got a Leinster Championship, which is which is great. But I think that, that that county now is looking for more, especially when you see budgetary figures what's been implied into the team. Okay, that's that's all really interesting because, uh, like, I, I guess last year. If if what happened last year happens again this year, then that makes obvious sense. If if they get back to the level they were at, where they're in an All Ireland semi final and the game is in the melting pot, again it'd be interesting to see how if the if the group has learned how to manage their way through that. Um, so if they're short of being contenders, 
is anybody close to the Limerick team at the moment? Are Tip and Galway the obvious ones who are there? Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Tip and Galway, my, my rankings, my rankings for all, for all they count for. Uh, Limerick are a clear number one. Um, the, the, they have a degree of separation from the rest of the pack at the moment, and I think it's been well publicised about all they do well, and they do very little not well. Um, then I think I have Galway number two, and then I have a split between Tipperary and Kilkenny as number as giant number three. I can't separate I, either or. Uh, the, the game, whatever way a game goes, in a certain day could could separate those by a point or, or two. Um, and then after that, then you've got again, and not to be dismissive, you've got the rest. Um, you've got Clare, Cork, Waterford in a pack, and then Wexford. That should say with Dublin coming coming after. You know, it's a difficult one. Um, I just think that you, you're looking at. Where Limerick stand right now, I'm not going to quite say they're, they're, they're where Kilkenny were in the mid 2000s or, or, or late 10s, say, but they're not too far away from it, to be honest with you. They haven't got quite the dominance um, that Kilkenny have had. But although, if you look at the names in the Cups over the last couple of years, Limerick have been, have been I suppose, shoving everyone out of the way. Um, but I, I think it's going to be a different type of championship this year. I think Limerick, uh, what they've done is this has been the same thing over the last couple of years, albeit very effective. But I, I just see maybe there's going to be a greater challenge to Limerick. Like they won't be winning Ireland final this year by 11 points like they did last year. Um, it'll go down to the wire big time. And I think that you've got the likes of Galway and Tipper Kinney who are going to challenge them most. I'm just going to text in here, James, comparing uh, the eras of, of Davy Fitz to Jose Mourinho, where almost after a couple of years, things start to, I don't know, grind down or, or, or maybe the, the level of early success isn't replicated. Is, is, that, is that a legit comparison, do you think? Is, is there something that you've seen that, that after a little period of time that things maybe aren't as good or as fresh as they were in those opening couple of seasons? Yeah, like I, I, modernisation, I think, you know, my time with Davy was back in 2007. We won the Fitzgibbon Cup with LIT. So you're talking 14, 15 seasons ago. And I th he's doing this. It looks to be, let's say, on the field, right? And, and technically speaking, he's doing the same things now as what was done back then in the college term, college times. Um, and I do, I do agree that whoever takes it in there has, is onto something as well because Mourinho, uh, he came out of the blue, let's say, um, not, he no, didn't have the best playing career, should I say, but then just blew up with Porto, and then he he got such a massive run of, run of success. And if you would just disregard the Waterford final, let's say, for Davy in 2008, where they're hammered by Kilkenny, and go after that, let's say. It culminated in him being successful with with Clare and then kind of having a great influence with Wexford. And you know, sometimes a change is good as a break. So like when, when when he went down to Wexford, that that change kind of rejuvenated everyone at Wexford and created an air of kind of positivity. And that culminated in, in in for me the peak being the Leinster Championship, you know, two years ago. And I don't think they they will they have reached similar heights. Obviously, they haven't reached similar heights from regards to everywhere. But off the field and on the field, I don't think they're where they need to be to challenge the top three or four. And I think that, as, as I said to you, I, I, I'm going back, I think this could be the last year uh, David is in Wexford, and I'm calling it now, I think it could be in Dublin next year. Right. Well, that would be pretty interesting, because uh, the mm -hmm. Dubs obviously just beat Galway last night in the yeah. under-20s, and that was a Galway team absolutely festooned with all Ireland winners. Uh, stacked is what the... <laughs> that, that Galway team was stacked. It was uh, very disappointing, very, very disappointing. You know, um, like I'm not just saying because we, we lost them. It's, it was a Leinster finalist, uh, but it was, you know, I thought it was a good route, if I'm honest, to get to a to an Ireland final, especially after taking down Kilkenny uh, last year. Um, it was surprising, you know. I, I thought we were very, we were very wasteful. You know what I mean? Um, like from from a, an individual basis, I know individuals come for speak if all if they on a team basis, but individual basis, we have outstanding holders in that team, especially in our forward unit, and we just didn't score enough. Like we were quite wasteful in front of goals. We had three clear cut goal opportunities that were, you know, denied by a good save or just wrong decisions, you know. And like, I think Dublin needed that game too. They had a, a kind of a, a stuttering league campaign, if, if, you, if you like. They're going into a game against Navan now, whereby they need a bit of positivity. Like, Matty hasn't had the, the best league or championship game in the last 18 months. Um, so, with those 20 guys coming back in now, and is, they're saying well done instead of hard luck. So, it's good for the vibe in the team as well and just adds more positivity to the whole thing. Um, whereas with, with Galway, the good thing is I don't think there's too many guys on the senior panel. I know Derek and Goals and TJ at, at full back, let's say, but I, I think the, the Galway team is seasoned enough, let's say, to just override that result and move on to the senior, senior championship. Can I go back to one thing there? You were saying if, uh, so if Paul Canark was to leave for whatever reason, and, and again, this is idle speculation, but if he was um, to take over a team like Wexford, are the raw materials there in Wexford or indeed any of the other counties at the moment? with the right coaching to, to put the challenge up to Limerick, bearing in mind 
you've compared Limerick to the great Kilkenny team, which is considered to be the greatest team of the mm -hmm. modern era. Like, so, do you know, I know they're not there yet, is what you said, and that it will be closer this year. Is, is coaching capable of making that much of a difference that almost any of those top teams in the right hands could put it up to Limerick on an All-Ireland final or semi-final day? Yeah, I just think you, like, now, don't get me wrong, I've, I've never met Paul Knock. I've never been part of his training session. I've just spoken to guys who have been within the setup and who speak rave reviews about him, let's say, and they would give me snippets of things he does. He says, drills, he operates, and the way he, the way he operates on a personal level with people. Um, now, when I'm saying Paul Knock, I'm, I'm including the whole management team as well in that. Um, but I, if you consider, go back a couple of years ago, um, would you have thought, I mean this respectfully, would you have thought the Morrissey's or Garrett Hegarty would have reached the heights they have? Even Graham Mulcahy, who I'd be friendly with, and he'd be my age, Graham Mulcahy didn't have the, he didn't set the world alight in his first, let's say, seven, eight years of inter-county hurling. And then he exploded. He exploded under Paul Knurk and got an Ulster, you know, when they won their Ireland. So I do think coaching has a huge, huge part to play. And like, I've watched Limerick, some of the Limerick guys in club games, let's say, on, on television last year, and we're looking up to see them, and they didn't stand out. You know, some of them didn't, they didn't stand out. Um, they didn't stand out in a way that you'd see PJ with Bally Hale or you'd see Cahill Manning with the Hasker. They just didn't stand out that way. And I just think it's all part of, you know, the, the, the group, the setting, the way they set up tactically. And I think, so if you had Paul Knurk and you brought him down to Wexford, I think there's great tangibles there, like I said. They've got great quality player, like an, an individual. But that's, that's why I said at the start of the conversation, their backs unit and their forwards unit aren't firing each for each other. Now, I just think that if, if someone went in with a new voice, and to change things up a small bit and give a different perspective, maybe more a more modern perspective, that Wexford could turn it around. Like they have, they have the tangibles there, they have they have the finance, you know, they have the facility. So like, like if if in a if in a mad world that he did go down, he would make a huge difference to Wexford. And again, like from a bookie's perspective, Wexford would go from number seven, eight up to you know four, three straight away. That, right. That's just the that's that's the influence I believe the Canuck would have. Right. A Canuck type person. That's really interesting. There's one last thing I wanted to, to get your thoughts on. Um, that we're always interested in trends and trends in the game. Some suggestion in, in various places recently that maybe giving five points for a goal might change the, the way that the game is being played at the moment because we're seeing such high high scores uh, in terms of the points being scored. I, I'm not even asking about that really, but is the trend, is, it, is there anything that might change the trend back to teams being goal hungry? Mm, yeah. Like I, I do think if you incentivize teams to go for like if, even if you raise it to four or five, five points, yeah, you're putting putting more pressure on the goalie first of all. But um, we, I think we do have to do something, something, guys, because like I just did a bit of research there over the last week on on, on the whole points situation. Like in the last five at Ireland finals, there's been an average of 25 points scored, whereas the five previous there was 18. So that's a that's a that's a huge difference in a final. You know, seven points is a huge. It's a huge distance, like, and the points situation is, is just getting a bit out of control because teams are looking at it and, and they're saying to themselves, we don't have to do it. You know, we don't have to go for goals because we can just shoot the lights out because when you mix the hurls, the slithers, the condition of the players, you know, and the quality of, of where they can shoot from shooting zones, that all leads itself towards scoring 30, 35, and we could potentially see 40 points in the championship game this year, which is, I don't know if that's ever been done. Um, but there, there just needs to be a degree of incentivization. Um, I, 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 would, I wouldn't like to see, I know I spoke about it before, a heavier ball. I like to see the ball modern, I just kind of modify the small bit. I would like to see, um, I'd love to see forwards, uh, and I mean this in a good way, the full forward line, I'd love to see them be kept and not being allowed to cross the line. You know what I mean? I'd love to see them, let's say, if you picked an imaginary 30 yard line and say, right, full forward line, you're not allowed to pass that line inside. I think that would help the situation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it, it would definitely help, let's say, the, the, the get around ultra defensive teams if you like um but i agree with you guys incentivization is key how we go about it i'm not, I'm not too sure i know we trialed the sideline cut before with two points but then guys got around that and they started shooting sidelines from all sides so that, that had to come back you know with, with joe kenning and Noel McGrath and whatnot so if you did go for five points for a goal let's say i think there would be a lot more direct hurling i think it would cut out an awful lot of you know middle third passing as they call it in, in, in you know intersection play between between guys who were only 10 15 yards apart from each other and again, it was so evident in last night's game, those guys just shooting passes for 10, 15 yards, sometimes for the sake of it. I think it's just now ingrained into the pattern of play for most teams at the moment because it's it's popular. You know, it's what Limerick are doing and, and it, that kind of the, that's the magic portion now to a successful team, you know. So uh, five five points for goal is a good shout. Good shout. I wouldn't like it as a goalie, though. <laughs> Cork won 140 against Westmead in, in 2019, I think, is is the record, James. So you can see that being, yeah. you can see that being surpassed at some point. Yeah, like, okay, we, again, with respect, 
the, the gulf in class between Cork mm. and, and Westmead, let's say, would be would have been substantial at the time, let's say. So 40 points would, yes, albeit it would be a surprise, but with that, that specific game, not so yeah. much. I think if you're looking at, you know, a Limerick versus Cork now, I'm not going to say it would happen, let's say, if 40 points were hit, my God, that's an element of madness entirely. Yeah. You know, that's when you, when you have quality opposition who are very close, or close-ish. That, that kind of score is just, it, it would... Uh, yeah. yeah well, let, let's see if it happens against a Division 1 team. And at that point, there, there'll definitely be a, a, a yeah. symposium on what's going wrong. James, this has been brilliant. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. No other folks, thanks. James Scale helping us to preview the start of the Hurling Championship this weekend properly. Dublin against Antrim at 3 o'clock on Saturday. Wexford against Leash at 6 on Saturday and then we didn't even talk about Clare and Waterford in any detail but that one throws in at half past three on Sunday.